I'm Eric Anderson. Um, if you ever see me come, ac come across me on GitHub, I'm Ejona86, uh, and I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, honestly, I'd be okay if someone asked me a question while I go, uh, but it might be a little easier for mics or things like that. Granted, I can repeat back um, if we wait to the end, but I'm not really too upset one way or the other. Um, but there, I, I do have time for questions. Um, and so I'll be talking about uh, modifying gRPC services over time, where basically uh, you've got your service, apparently it's not a fixed thing, um, and you need to extend it. Um, so as far as intended audience, there's actually a couple different ways you can go about um, this sort of talk. Uh, but I, I hope that you've toyed at least with gRPC and protobuf. You know what the protobuf compiler is to give you the generated code. Um, you have messed with a couple different primitive data types in protobuf. Uh, those things aren't scary to you in any way. Um, that's where I sort of hope that you're in that sort of that, that place um, in order to really understand the talk. Um, but um, you know, it's, I guess, you, you'll pick, you'll have to dull if you're not. Um, but also, you, you've started making your own services, you've started playing with it, um, and then you start getting questions of should I do this or that, or surely there's a better way to do so this. Um, and so you're searching for some best practices and idioms. Um, I need to make some assumptions though, because there's many, many different ways to use this stuff. Um, so I am going to assume that we're, we're caring about cross-platform, cross-language, um, and we can't do tricks that only work for some people, um, for some clients or something like that. Um, also, I'm assuming this is gRPC native. I know that REST, uh, using REST with gRPC is, is, is definitely a thing. Um, I'm, I'm completely good with that, um, but it's not going to be as much of a focus here. There's actually some other um, documentation on how to build nice, clean uh, REST APIs uh, with gRPC. Um, although I am aware of it, so it'll, it'll seep through some places. Um, and also, I'm assuming that servers are updated before clients. Uh, this might seem completely obvious to you, but if you have a backend scenario that you're using gRPC to communicate uh, between two servers, you can totally have a, you update one server before the other. It's actually a client, and it sees some new updated protos and fields and stuff before the other. And so um, it's not as much for those cases. Granted, um, you've got some things that are harder in that case because you can upgrade both ways, but um, you also are in control, more control, so some things become easier. But I'm not really talking about that. Um, it's also not the case of someone defined a service and now there's gonna be multiple impl implementations. Um, if you're doing those sorts of services, you, you have to have um, a little bit uh, different view of, of what is supported by the server. Um, so we're, we're talking about changing something over time. There have to be some constraints. Well, that's actually compatibility with all the people who are currently using your service. Um, but there's lots of different types of compatibility. You can have binary and source compatibility, which relate more to the genera generated code, um, and the, that involves particular languages. Then you have wire compatibility, which would be um, how are things serialized on the wire. Um, will uh, it, this uh, it was doing that earlier as well. Um, and then you've got behavioral compatibility, behavioral compatibility, where um, Everything's good on the wire, everything seems fine, but your application is now, let's say, interpreting something differently than it was before, and that ends up breaking a, a client. So to just start, we'll take a binary and source just at the same time. Um, and there's actually quite a few languages that Protobuf uh, and gRPC support. And so that means basically all bets are off if you're trying to do something fancy. Um, if you rename or remove something, those totally will break someone, that's not, nor that's not surprised to anyone probably. Um, if you change a method type from one name to another, um, that's gonna change method signatures, that'll totally break people um, uh, in, in like statically compiled languages, but maybe it wouldn't have break, broken someone if they were using Python or something like that. Um, primitive type changes, you're like, oh, this was an int32, I'm now gonna make it an int64, and you're like, oh, that's fine, they're both integers, but um, lots of languages will not be happy with you on that because it'll be an implicit cast or something like that. So that basically leaves us with adding services, methods, messages, and fields, which if you've done much like library API maintenance and stuff, isn't surprising. You can basically add stuff. That is the limitation. And so um, as we sort of go through this, it's like, okay, how do we um, make use of this, this knowledge? Um, so let's say we just 
sort of had this conceptual library service, which is in some is used as an example in some places. Um, so we've got we want to be able to create a book, uh, go ahead and get a book, list stuff, delete stuff, um, and update the book as well. Um, and so, like, I put in list book here as a string. That's going to be some identifier for the book. Um, it's going to be, let's say, the book name, um, or, but it's guaranteed to be unique. Um, and uh, over in list books, um, if you're not familiar with um, protobuf, the google.protobuf.empty, that is just a message with nothing in it. Um, so it's the, the equivalent of a void um, in some languages. Um, so this is sort of what we're starting with. Um, I'm not saying that this actually works, but this is what we're wanting to do. Um, and we're sort of going from here um, to, to further, uh, to, to, to make it actually uh, maintainable. And so I introduced some of these best practices. Um, we should plan for the replacement of the service, ideally. Um, so it, right now it's suggested to include the version number in the package name itself. So um, up at the very top that we have the package. Uh, that's what I'm talking about here. So you could include a V1. Um, it's actually not that big of a deal if you forget to do that because you can have a V2 on the V2. Um, but having a, a, a version um, in the package or, or in the service name itself um, can be a good way of, of separating uh, things whenever you have a breaking API change in the, the service change in the future. Um, also, we, uh, JRPC doesn't let you have multiple arguments um, or some things like that. It relies very, very heavily on, um, on messages and you extending messages. So you want to use messages for your extending point because that's the intention. If you, if you sort of avoid them, uh, you're gonna have some trouble. So when in doubt, create a new message for each RPC method. So you've got foo method and you're gonna have foo method request and foo method response. And you can just go about that just all day long. Um, and that allows you to have a very, very fine scope for adding things in the future. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then you can also feel free to add new services and methods as necessary. You don't have to limit yourself to just a very, very few number of methods. You can add them as they're useful, um, but at the same time, don't have an explosion for every single different combination of, of um, possible arguments. Um, this is probably nothing very special. Um, methods are great, but if you have tons of them, you start uh, drowning in just the, the, the counts that they are. And so here's some of the changes that I made to that earlier sort of conceptual model. I've gone ahead and put a V1 in the package. Um, and then I've created a request um, arguments for each of these, um, or request messages for each of these methods. And that it means that if in the future list books, now all of a sudden we want to, let's say, have a filter for you to be able to uh, say only certain books uh, am I interested in, you have a place to put that. If you didn't do this, it's not the worst, in the worst thing in the world. You would just need a new method that then has um, some message where you could specify those things. But adding, adding extra parameters to, a, um, to an RPC is just happens all the time. And so you, you can plan for it a little bit. And then you uh, avoid having tons and tons of methods. Um, to, to, that one was sort of resty. Uh, let's say that we've got something more functional. Um, like a, a computational. And so let's say we've got this um, nice infrastructure. We're in the infrastructure and we're providing a, a clock service. It's really, really advanced. Um, you call it with no arguments, that's the empty, and then you get back a timestamp. This is, this is in some ways fine, but you, you might instead choose to go ahead and make the request, make the response um, message types, and they would just be on the end. So this is, um, it seems boilerplate, platey. Um, Again, it would have been okay if we forgot. We would have just ended up having a get better time method later. Um, but doing this ahead of time does save us that cost. And really, if for the users, um, it's not that much harder to use this API versus the one we had before. Um, so it, it's not with too much cost. Oh, hey, hello, people chatting with me. Um, all right, so, th so that gets us um, binary and source. Now we're gonna go ahead and go on to wire compatibility. This one's a little bit more in depth. Um, so RBCs and gRPC are only disting distinguished by their name. So that is the package they're in, the service name itself, and then the method name. Anything else th than that is implicit. 
Um, and so that means request and response types are implicit, those names that are used. Um, the cardinality, whether it's a streaming request or a streaming response or just a single request, um, those things are, are implicit. That means you could go ahead and add new services and methods because those have a different name and such they won't collide with anything before. It also means you could change a message from one type to another if you were really wanting to, and you could go ahead and add a stream keyword to an existing method. But because of where we were before with APIs, doing those last two will totally break, break people in, at compilation time. Now granted, if you can force people to get a compilation error and then they'll update, but um, it doesn't work as well. Wire compatibility for protobuf is, is, is even a little bit more granted. Uh, a lot of people have had familiar, familiar, are already familiar with protobuf, so they may be aware of some of this. Um, and some of this is slightly different in proto3 than proto2. But um, message names are implicit. So um, if you change the, the, the message from one name to another, it's, it can act like the same thing. Um, except when that's not the case, like any. Um, and except, uh, I guess, metadata would, would also be a common case where it sort of leaks through. Field names are also implicit. That's why we've got the tags where you know, you've got the equals one at the end of your field. Um, those are also implicit except when they're not. JSON, um, converting to and from JSON is pretty common, and field mask is maybe something that you might want to use. I'll talk about it later. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm saying it is, but then it's also not. Uh, we do know that field tags are explicit. You cannot change the, 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 the tag where it says equals one, equals two, equals three at the end. If you change that, yes, you're, you're totally gonna be uh, breaking someone. That should not be a surprise. Um, one interesting thing is some tags are the same on the wire. Uh, sorry, some types are the same on the wire. Int32 is the same as int64. So that means you could actually say, ah, I'm going to upgrade, I need some more bits. I'm gonna upgrade this to an int64. Uh, as far as protobuf concern, is concerned, that would be fine. Um, but it's risky because of the API um, and the ABI stuff earlier. So really nothing new. Our limitations were pre-existing. Um, we're really just limited by binary and source compa uh, com uh, compatibility. So um, I don't know what that same practice is. Oh, yes, we follow the same practices we were talking about before um, with, bi with the binary and source. Now, yes, You've got more options here. If you don't care about that binary and source, you could do more fiddly bits here. Um, you think, oh, I control both the server and the client. That means I can control things. However, in a larger application, even if you control both sides, it's actually really hard to, to make a breaking change all at once to the entire code base. And so you start, start having to, um, to abide by the earlier rules. You, you really only get to break stuff whenever it's a small enough project and you control both sides. And then that takes us to behavior compatibility, which is actually really, really wide scope. Um, most of your effort, I think, will actually be spent here. The other stuff, you can add stuff. That's easy. We move on with life. Um, here is the application-specific pieces, which means I can't necessarily solve all of y'all's problems. Everyone's going to have a different problem. Um, but there are some common patterns that y'all might actually want to know about. Um, so here's some of the best practices I want to talk about. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the, the new primitive fields default to zero or empty string or the, the each primitive sort of has its default. Now that is actually a statement that is just true. That is how new default fields work in Proto3. Um, the point of this is to actually accept that. It, 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 that's how Proto3 works. Don't try to, um, to avoid it just because you think that that's silly. Um, there are ways to avoid it, there are ways to get around it, but if you um, just let the zero value be the I don't care value or the default value, um, you'll, you'll probably have a better time. Um, if you need to, if you need to know field presence, because that was removed in, in Proto2 to Proto3, um, you, there are these, these wrappers, um, and in fact it's called wrappers.proto. So every primitive field has one of these wrappers. Um, and so it's really, really complex as in you've got a string value and it contains a value. That's, it contains a string value. That's, that's all we're talking about. These are not anything that are really special. It's just that we need them and so there's some well-defined ones that are already made for you. Um, 
So you're free to use those. Also, if there's a couple different fields um, that you need to sort of know about whether they're there or not together, you can go ahead and make one of your message that's custom that has those specific fields, and that message overall is either present or not. Um, but all of this relies on the fact that while we lost field presence for primitives, it's still there for, for messages. And this is actually not really all that strange. Most programming languages actually deal, deal this way. You have an int in your Java or C, and there is no, oh, this int isn't there. You're sort of forced to make it zero or, or negative one or something like that. Um, and if you need it, to, to, if you need to know whether it's there or not, you end up making a pointer to it and then having it be null or something like that. That's the same thing as this. This is just normal boxing that, that takes place in languages. Um, so moving on, we, there's uh, updates. Um, whenever you add a new field, if you're not a little careful, you could actually have some client that's doing an update clearing that field. So let's say that we, we, we've got our library service before, um, so I just took out the important part, parts. We've got update book, and I ask, all right, this is the book I want the new contents to be. That's the, in the request. And then in the, um, the book response is the name, the author, and the title. And that's, that's really all we have right now. Well, and I guess let's, let's say that I'm actually, there's an, a client that's pre-existing today, and it looks at the book request, and it goes ahead and updates the author name because it was misspelled or, or something like that. Um, so it would commonly get the, the current book, it would modify the message, and then it would upload it again via update book. If we end up having a new field, because apparently users were, were forced to keep on reading the same book over and over, we're now going to introduce this field called red. And if it's red, now then we have a little icon or something on the UI to tell, hey, user, you might not be as interested in this book. So if there's an existing client that was modifying the author, it downloaded it, the, the red bit was, let's say, on, Whenever it processed that, it would actually, the, that client, which was older, would throw it away because it wouldn't know about red. And so then whenever the client then modifies author and then uploads the, the, the changed version, the server now thinks that this, the client was clearing red because it looks at the value of red and it's now zero. So it's now accidentally performing a change. Um, this was not as much of a problem in Proto 2 because you had field presence. So you'd see, oh, red isn't there. It must not be a set. Um, so field mask is actually a partial solution to this. Um, you might not have looked at field mask before. Um, it's, it's there, um, but it's not necessarily advertised in a lot of places. And so basically all it is is you say which fields you care about. Uh, this is useful for both querying, where you say, I only care about these three fields. Don't bother looking up the rest from the database. Uh, but this can also be useful for um, updating, where you say these are the, the fields that are actually selected. And so um, it can have a, a basically a repeated field of paths where you specify. And it works fine with sub-messages. If you have messages nested inside of other messages, you can say just the fields you're interested in. Um, and field mask defaults to all fields because this works pretty well for querying, where you say just get me everything um, and you don't need to field, fill in the field mask. Um, the, the reason I say that this is a partial solution is while it would solve our problem from before because the, uh, the client would say I only updated author and so the server would know to only update author, um, it's really annoying to use all the time. Um, it's, it, it's fine to use some places, this just doesn't hurt, but if like every single API you started throwing this in, um, you'd get probably pretty annoyed with, with specifying these fields. Um, but this is how you'd use it. So we had our update book request from earlier, and you just go ahead and specify a mask um, in that request. And then this is what Java would look like, but each, um, uh, each language has some helper utility in order to use this field mask. And so we go ahead and get the name of the book, and we load the book from the database with its current values as they are right now. Then we do this utility function. What this does is it, is it copies fields, and I can even point with this, eh, no. Uh, we, we, it copies fields, fields from the request book into the destination book, into the current version that we just grabbed from the database. But it filters based on the mask, so it only copies the ones that are listed in the field mask. And at the end of it all, we'll go ahead and 
push the, the, the book back into the database at the very, very end. Um, so that's basically the flow. Uh, there are some options that on, on the field mask util. If you're doing this yourself, you, can, you should probably take a look at those. Um, but it's sort of not important for this. Um, so going a little bit more, um, I mentioned it earlier, there's actually some other um, API guides. Um, the REST one suggests not to add new fields um, to things that are updated in this fashion. Not all of your messages um, are used with that sort of update request. Um, that, that's actually a little bit hard in my, in my mind. Um, granted, there's reasons for it. Um, I think that this is still slightly an unsolved problem, except that protobuf 3.5 re-adds unknown field support. So um, the initial problem was that the client threw away the request, sorry, the, the, the red field. With uh, unknown fields, the client would go ahead and save that. And it has no clue what it is, but it just saves it. And if that message gets serialized again, so it, it didn't know it whenever it read it, whenever it serializes it again, it'll go ahead and re-add that, um, that field. And so it's just a pass-through mechanism. Um, and that's useful if you end up persisting stuff in a database or something like that, like a local data cache or something like that. Um, whenever you do understand what these fields are, you would be able to read them. But also in this case, it allows pass-through. Um, and so the unknown fields are no longer cleared. So in a, in a couple more months, as Protobuf 3.5 sees more and more clients using it, this may be a problem that is just not an issue anymore. Um, it just sort of evaporates if you can require the protobuf 3.5. So um, some people don't necessarily know how to use air details with gRPC. That's completely fair. Um, so there is, so, so what, you, what the suggestion is, we've got the, the status code, and that's good, but it's very, very coarse. For additional information, you should make a message for it. And you make that however you want. It's for whatever is useful for your application to say, OK, this failed. Client, whenever you need to know what went wrong, here's, here's what you look at. Um, and you can use a message for each different type of failure um, or for a small class. There's actually some predefined ones in airdetails.proto. Um, I just took a sampling here. There's, there's some more. A debug info is just like a list of stacks, uh, just, just as strings. Quota failure has a little bit of information to say, oh, was this a failure because that particular client was doing too many QPS? Or is this a failure because um, the user ran out of disk space? Um, so it can um, provide a little more information there. Help just provides a link to a documentation so that whenever someone sees this, they can actually go and look up what the actual uh, more words than can fit in the description. They can look at uh, what went wrong. Um, there's also a localized message, which is useful because the normal description uh, will be in like English. Localized message can be a um, localized string for whoever the, the client is, and so then they can read it. Um, so the recommended practice um, is to use these messages and they need to put them somewhere. That really is put them in metadata, um, which is what we used to recommend. Um, it turned out to be hard to pass that around in some languages. Um, and it was unclear, you've got this metadata and you've got this error. It was a little unclear which, how they related exactly what. So was the particular metadata uh, key because of the error? Or was that just extra information, let's say tracing information or something like that? Um, and so Google RPC status is pretty simple. It's the code in the message, which exists in gRPC today, and then an any for details. Um, we actually, gRPC actually used to use this exact message type for its um, response status, and there was a point that we decided to remove the dependency on protobuf, and so we went ahead and removed this, this message. But we, didn't, we decided not to put details anywhere other than just the metadata, because the metadata would work well for that. It turns out that, that it does work. Um, it's just sort of a little bit hard in APIs um, to propagate all these things together. Um, so uh, languages are receiving utilities to work nicely with uh, Google RPC status. Not every language has it yet, but it's coming. Um, and so for like Java, here's the difference of before and after. Um, you, you end up getting a status, this Google RPC, com Google RPC status as opposed to the normal status. Um, and this is what the client code would look like. Uh, but then you have that any field where you can put um, associated information if you're propagating it with 
um, I guess exceptions in Java was a little handled already. Java was, was able to do it. Some other languages, it will propagate more nicely with error paths. Um, and then the last thing, um, because we like streams and we like long-lived RPCs, that's one of the, the things that are really nice to do uh, because you can issue the request and just wait for an event to happen. Um, I highly suggest that you um, break that occasionally because clients are really easy at avoiding work that they don't have to do. So um, whether, in, whether on purpose or not, um, and so if a client doesn't realize they need to handle the fact that, oh, this RPC might fail before it completes, uh, then they very likely will have some bug in that code path. Um, and so go ahead and, if there's something that takes a while, go ahead and sometimes purposefully complete the RPC uh, prematurely. That could just be after a fixed age or randomly just to introduce some noise. Um, and then the client will see that it, it, um, it completed early and then go ahead and reissue the request and then it'll, it'll be able to wait a while longer. Um, there are some cases that this can free up connections, um, but as far as this goes, um, I'm mainly talking about it for the client code health. And now we're to Q&A. Thank, thank you, thank you. He's, he's in the room right here. <laughs> oh. No audio? No. <laughs> no, none, it seems. Oh, look, oh, oh. <laughs> um, so does, does anyone have any questions? Like, this is, I guess, free for all because people have probably dealt with their own problems. Did, were people following what was happening with the, um, the unknown fields? Uh, Y'all might not have even noticed that unknown fields were being added in Proto 3.5. Um, I think a lot of people, that probably makes them pretty happy because that was a, a feature they sorely missed from Proto 2. Um, now, how's the communication between Proto Buff versions? Can I, can I have a 2.0 communication at 3.5 communication? So the question was, um, how do the versions work? Or how do they, they interact? Or are they compatible? Yeah. Um, so, to begin with, most languages, if, if it supported Protobuf 2 originally, Protobuf 3 runtime also supports Protobuf 2. So you can mix and match however you want um, in that case. Now granted, Protobuf 3 supports more languages. Um, it was a simplification in part to allow more languages to be supported. Um, and so you may not have as, as many client languages that can support it, but if you like Proto 2, you can keep Proto 2, and gRPC works fine with Proto 2. Um, it is, as far as wire compatibility, um, Protobuf 3 and Protobuf 2 use the same wire format. There is some compatibility there. Um, the, the intended way of, of dealing with it is, um, let's say you've got a Protobuf 3 client and then you've got a Protobuf 2 server. The Protobuf 2 server um, sees a little bit more information than the Protobuf 3. And so if you're going to have them differ, you would probably have the consuming side be Protobuf 2 because you can then see um, a little bit more information. But um, it can work a little bit both, both ways if you're, if you're careful. Um, as far as some of the features and stuff that were added in Protobuf 3, there's all Protobuf 2 equivalents to them and, and things like that. So there, there is, it was understood that you might need to, to mix and match a little bit. Um, and as far as the, the Protobuf 2 and Protobuf 3 compatibility, um, as far as which type you use. Um, those, you can actually have Proto 3 messages to include Proto 2 messages and even that level. It's not like you have to have a particular tree of messages that you don't cross the streams. Um, you, you can actually mix and match a little bit more than that. And uh, what do I know if memory compatibility between systems? Uh, so the question is, when do you know when you break compatibility between systems? Between Proto 2 and Proto 3, is that what you're saying? So that is basically getting here, add stuff, don't remove stuff, don't change names. Um, if you aren't wanting to support JSON um, or field masks, you can change names. That was classically completely fine to do in Protobuf. Um, but generally nowadays it's, it's a little bit closer to just add. Okay. There was a question over here. Uh, so the question is, was there any request from the community for JSON RPC compatibility um, or translation? I've not seen any for, for specifically JSON RPC. 
uh, there is quite a bit of translation between protobuf and JavaScript and JSON. Um, now, granted, that is that may not. Uh, I think some people get a little confused on that. That is, if you have a protobuf message, there is a JSON encoding for it, and you can go back and forth between it. It's not. I have some arbitrary JSON, and I want a protobuf message for it. It doesn't quite. It's not quite as useful for that. You may get lucky, but you may not. Um, I've not seen anything for JSON RPC specifically. Um, it seems very possible. Um, I think most of the tools are already there. If if you were so inclined. But I, I, don't, I don't know of any movement in that front. Oh, so n not many questions. You all have had no tr trouble making APIs and letting them survive the test of time. Granted, gRPC is only so old, but um, it, this must be really, really easy. Uh, your problem now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so the question is, is there any way to add gzip compression after the server's already deployed uh, and the, the clients are, are using it? Actually, so the server doesn't support? Yeah, so if you have a server and clients with, uh, without enabled gzip compression? And, and so you're worried that some clients may not support gzip? Okay, so this is um, dealing some with uh, the, the handshaking that goes in with gzip. Uh, in general, you should be fine if you are wanting to respond with gzip. Uh, basically, you should be able to generally just say, I want to use gzip, and then the server says, haha, the client doesn't support that. Um, and then just, it'll send it back uncompressed. Or, and APIs may vary on a little bit on that per language, but basically there should be no problem for the server to send back gzip whenever it wants to do gzip, because the client informs the server what it supports. The much harder case is whenever the client wants to send gzip, because it doesn't know, like it needs to know what the, the, the server supports, but the server, there's not a handshake before you do the message. Um, and so the main thing we did there was to make sure that servers supported um, a gzip before 1.0. So you've, you've got that going for you. You know that uh, you can make a client that goes against something that's at least gRPC 1.0 server and things should work. Um, but if there's, let's say, a new compression protocol or, or compression type, um, you're still gonna have that problem. I think that that part is unsolved. Um, I would like, to, I think that we might be able to solve it some with um, uh, client config uh, in order to notify the client ahead of time. Um, but if you're just wanting to send back, it, it, were you wanting to, to respond with gzip? Yeah, so the okay. Um, okay, so it sounds like you were maybe hitting a bug or an API gotcha. Um, that, that we, there should be a, a solution for that. I'm not sure exactly which one you, you had, but we, we can maybe talk about that and figure out which language you're in uh, to figure out if there was a the misstep. I think it may be possible for some of the APIs to let you choose a compression format that the client doesn't support because you know better. <laughs> Um, and maybe the client is hiding it from you, um, but uh, I'm not sure that that was necessarily what you were using. Um, uh, how does the compression would play, play along with the binary uh, limitation? Because you're sending binary payloads, uh, theoretically, you don't need any compression to handle. Uh, how, how, is the, how, how does uh, the binary payload play into why, using compression? When you serialize a mesh in gRPC, you're sending a binary payload to the other side. So theoretically, you don't need any compression. Um, so, so the question is, why would you use compression with uh, gRPC? So there's a couple different reasons. Uh, one, you can compress just one message worth of content. And so let's say that you're transporting a bunch of bytes from a file. Well, those bytes might be compressible. And so you're like, well, let's compress them. Also, there's plenty of strings in protobuf messages. Apparently, they only use so many bits um, because they're ASCII and things like that. And so you can also get some savings there. Um, there is a, a further thing that we're working on, um, although it's in various forms and it may have stalled a little bit because of, of push. Um, 
but uh, we were working some on full stream compression where you could actually send a stream and multiple messages would be able to be compressed with one compression context. Uh, the, the, that's most similar, I guess, normally to if you have a repeated field and you've got very similar data. Um, one message to the next will be similar because lots of data happens to be similar. It's the same name over and over. You've got a prefix as part of your ID name. Um, and so those could all be stripped out. Um, and the, the full streaming compression was, was also assuming that fact. Um, also, some people will send like HTML responses back sometimes or, or things like that. And there's plenty of payloads that compress well. I don't remember the exact time this ends. Okay, so it's technically ended um, one minute ago. Um, Y'all are free. Um, if y'all have any more questions, I'm gonna be around. Y'all can catch me. <laughs>